Hello, everybody. Thank you all for uh, for coming out today. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a great day for our small group to meet out here. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to open up, uh, open this up in a word of prayer. So, Father, we come before you, Lord. I pray that uh, that the ears of your servants would be attentive, Lord, and that the hearts would be willing to to change, you know, according to your word. Um, I pray that you would give me wisdom, Lord, as I preach your word. Uh, I pray that this would be a great time of fellowship uh, with one another, Father, and and faithfulness with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, I'm going to be preaching from Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Uh, Open up your Bibles if you would. I'm reading from the ESV. I call it the Elect Standard Version. Uh, So uh, this is uh, Micah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, Hear what the Lord says. Arise and plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear ye mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and your enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, O oh, my people, remember what Balak the king of Moab devised, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Sukim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before God on high? What shall I, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So uh, sort of the main thing I want you to see in this text is that the Lord has been faithful to his servants, does not require compulsive, hollow sacrifices, but wants his servants to have hearts that are turned to him, and he wants servants that are faithful to him. And man must realize that his works are insufficient to give him a right relationship with God, and they must instead rely on, on faithful, purified hearts. Uh, so let me begin with a, a story. This is a story I love to tell. Uh, about two weeks ago, well, first of all, as many of you know, I have a wonderful girlfriend named Hannah Nolte, who uh, happens to actually be in the audience today. Say hi, Hannah, will you? Hello. Uh, thank, you thank you, Hannah. <laughs> so uh, Hannah's actually home from school this weekend. She's studying nursing in, in Tennessee. Um, about two weeks ago, I actually drove up to see her um, I helped her move in um, in August, and 33 we- days went by, and I didn't get to see her. It was all phone calls, it was all texts and FaceTime, but I never got to see her in person for 33 days. So about two weeks ago, I got in my car, and I drove seven and a half hours to go see her. I was so excited. I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. I couldn't wait, so I hopped in my car and just drove it straight to, to Chattanooga. Um, and uh, I got there at, like I don't know, like 1.30 in the afternoon. But before I went and saw her, I had to stop by a place called Food City, which is sort of like Tennessee's uh, local food line. Um, And I had to do two things. I had to buy her flowers because you can't visit a pretty young lady like Hannah without buying her flowers. And I had to change shirts. I had to put on this nice little purple button-up shirt because I wanted to look presentable for her. Um, So I buy the flowers. I put on a new shirt. And I drive to campus. Uh, and I got to her building just in the nick of time because I saw her exiting the building. She's got her little backpack on, and she was actually trying to call me. I didn't answer the phone, so I could see her. Uh, and, <laughs> and so we look up, we lock eyes. The first time we had seen each other in over a month, and no shame, we just ran full speed towards each other. Oh, I fell over there. We just ran full speed towards each other as fast as we could. We met each other. We just hugged each other, and we like laughed and we celebrated. And Hannah cried. And I may or may not have cried just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. Uh, And that was seriously one of the best memories of my entire life. One of the best experiences of my life. I will never forget that. That was the best feeling ever. uh, Because it had been over a month. And now finally, the one that I loved and I were finally together. And it was just, just very, very wonderful. Let me ask you this, though. Why did I buy Hannah flowers? And why did I put on a new shirt for her? Uh, did I go to Food City thinking, okay, I got to pick out the perfect, the prettiest flowers because uh, uh, because if I don't buy Hannah flowers, then she's not gonna she's not gonna run to me. I really want Hannah to run to me when she sees me, not walk to me. So if I want her to run to me instead of walk, I got to buy her flowers. I didn't say, you know, I, if I want Hannah to hug me, I got to put on a nice shirt because otherwise she's not gonna hug me. No, I knew that Hannah was gonna run to me. I knew that she was gonna hug me no matter if I had flowers and no matter what shirt I was wearing. 
and I can tell you Hannah didn't look at me across the parking lot and say, oh my goodness, look at those beautiful flowers. Let me run to those flowers as fast as I can. She didn't do that. And she didn't say, oh my goodness, look at that nice purple button up shirt. Let me go and let me put my arms around that nice shirt. No, she didn't do that. She looked across the parking lot. We both looked across the parking lot and we said, oh my goodness, there's a person that I love so, so, so much. Let me run to them. The flowers and the shirt were nice, but the flowers and the shirt didn't define our relationship. The reason why we ran to each other is because we love one another. We love each other's hearts so, so much. This is a nice story. Uh, one of the, seriously, my favorite memories of all time. Uh, but sadly, in Micah chapter 6, Micah is telling the story of the Israelites buying God flowers and putting on a nice shirt for God and thinking that that is what defines their relationship with him. So the first thing I want you to see from this passage is that God has been totally faithful and loving to his people, yet the people have still rejected him. I get this from verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Micah says, Hear what the Lord says. Arise and plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains the indictment of the Lord, and your enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. Beor answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. So in verses 1 through 5, God, uh, he sort of gives a, uh, he, he sort of highlights the people, he, he goes over some of uh, the highlights of Israel's history. If I can give you the history of the of Israel in like five seconds, it would be this. God is faithful, Israel is unfaithful. Over and over again, this is what we find. It's just this constant, constant cycle of God's faithfulness, his love and his mercy and his kindness and his deliverance. And then in, the ret in return, the people, they sacrifice to these foreign gods. They become idolaters. They reject the Lord. Uh, they fall into all kinds of you know, forms of immorality. Uh, they, a lot of what Micah talks about is like the oppression of the poor, the widows, the needy. Um, so they neglect their neighbors, they aren't loving towards their neighbors, and then they offer sacrifices to these foreign gods. So they are wicked, wicked idolaters, basically. But in this passage, what God is doing is he's reminding the people of his faithfulness. And it's almost like God is asking, like, what did I do to deserve your unfaithfulness? Does that make sense? He goes through uh, the history of Israel, including uh, their exodus from Egypt and him bringing, through, bringing them through the Red Sea. Uh, and it's almost like he's saying, what what else can I do, right? Like, how much better of a God can I be? How much more faithful can I be? Like, what can I do to give, like, what can I do to, what have I done to warrant your unfaithfulness? Um, so what we find is that God, in this wonderful just act of his, his love and his mercy and his faithfulness, he brings the Israelites through the Red Sea, and then they get to the other side, woohoo, we made it, the Egyptians are dead. And then they build a gold calf and they sacrifice to it. And every single one of them dies in the wilderness because God is faithful, but the Israelites are unfaithful. My charge to you is to, uh, what I want you to realize today is that uh, God has only continued to show his faithfulness to his people. Uh, God has done more than just bring his people out of bondage to, to um, a foreign adversary. God has brought his people out of a greater bondage, a bondage to sin, uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. But, People are still unfaithful to him. People within the church, they go to church on Sunday morning. Woohoo, yeah, God is so great. Just like those Israels. Yo, yeah, Jesus, yes, yes, God delivered us from, from you know, the devil. You know, and then just like the Israelites, they get through the wilderness, or they go to the wilderness, and many people today are offering sacrifices, proverbially, to unknown gods. There are many people within the church. Woohoo, yay, Jesus, we love Jesus. And then they become idolaters, they become immoral. They don't care about the poor. They don't care about the needy. My charge to you is to, to do sort of like a gut check and say, wait a second, God has been so faithful to me. I need to be faithful in return. I want you to recognize these idols that you have set up in your life. I want you to recognize the things in your life that you are not willing to give up for God's sake. And I want you to realize that God is so loving. He is so faithful. God is worthy of your faithfulness to him. 
I, I'm going to move on. Uh, the second thing I want you to see is that hollow works of the law and compulsive good deeds are unable to give man a right relationship with God. Uh, this is from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. He says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression and the fruit of my body, oops, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Uh, what I want you to see is that, uh, uh, and Micah points out basically that that God has been so faithful to his people that if you were to walk into a temple at that time, uh, what you would see is a bunch of priests standing around with like a bloody knife standing next to all these goats because, you know, God commanded them to, to offer sacrifices in the temple. You know, they would be standing there with a knife, slitting a bunch of like goats' throats, like cutting the heads off of like little birds and stuff like that. And if you were to ask them, Hey, you know, like, why are you doing this? What they would say is, oh, I don't know. This is just kind of what we do. We, you know, we kill some goats, sleep with some temple prostitutes, and we pour some wine on the altar. Does that make sense? In other words, what, what Micah is saying is the people of Israel, they have just, they're so delusional. What they have done is, is they have they have offered these, these ritual sacrifices to God, and they don't even know what it means. Does that make sense? Uh, and, and it's almost like God is saying to them, like, you know what, I, thanks for the goats, but, like, I don't actually drink their blood. You know, thanks for the wine, like, pour that on the altar all that you want, but I don't actually drink that. Does that make sense? And so over and over what the people have done is they have offered these sacrifices to God simply out of compulsion uh, and simply out of habit, these hollow sacrifices, yet their hearts are so far from God. And what God is saying, I don't care about your goats, you know, like, thanks, but those goats, they smell bad, you know. I don't care about your wine, but like, you know that you just pour that on the altar, and then it goes right in the dirt. I don't actually drink that wine that you're pouring on the altar. Does that make sense? Um, in fact, well, let me say this. I don't know. I don't want to jump too far ahead. I will say this, though. I feel like not much has changed since then. Uh, God's people, you know, if you were to walk into a church today, and if you were to say, hey, what gives you a right relationship with God? They would say, well, it's because I go to church. I'm here at church, right? So since I'm in church, I have to be a Christian, you know? Or, you know, I'm volunteering at VBS next week, or I tithe. And so isn't that good enough? And it's like God's saying, hey, thanks for volunteering. Thanks for that check you put in the offering plate. You know, thanks for coming to church. But I don't know you. In fact, this is what Jesus is saying. And turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. It would take a second to get there because I don't have it bookmarked. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, this is Jesus speaking. Um, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, men will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And so what Jesus is saying right here is that there's a lot of people who think that they're good. They're saved if you're wanting to say that. They think that they are saved. Uh, and Jesus is saying, like, okay, you're standing at the pearly gates. Why should I let you in? Well, it's because I cast out these demons, right? And I've laid my hands on a sick person. He jumped right up. That was great. And I prophesied in your name, Jesus. Isn't that enough? And Jesus is saying, okay, thank you for the prophecies. And thank you for casting out the demons. Thank you for laying your hands on these sick people. But where's your heart? I didn't actually, I never knew you because your heart is so, so, so far from me. These people, they're going to come before Jesus and immediately point to their works, just like the Israelites in Micah chapter 6 have done. They come to God and they say, God, aren't we such great servants of you? Look, I sacrificed 20 goats today. No, I sacrificed 30 goats yesterday. Doesn't that make me such a great servant? And God's saying, okay, yeah, cool, good job killing all those goats, but where's your heart? I know where your heart is. God knows your heart. And God's saying to the Israelites in this passage, and Jesus is saying uh, to, to you know, um, so-called people who think that they are saved in, in Matthew 7, and I'm saying to you now, great job going to church, you know, great job volunteering at VBS, but how is your heart? Is your heart far from God? Um, how are you doing? Uh, and so that's what I want to ask you today. Like, thank you for volunteering at VBS. Thanks for tithing. But where's your heart? So I was trying to think of a good illustration. I do not like 
illustrations very much. Well, illustrations are okay, but I kind of have a hard time with them. So I was trying to think of a good way to illustrate this, and then I looked at the calendar, and I saw that it's almost October. And if I can, like, I, just, I need you guys to pray for me. I'm about to confess something major here. I'm a big Hallmark fan. I love Hallmark movies, okay? And so when I saw it was October, I, like, jumped up, and I did a little heel flip like that. <laughs> because I love Hallmark movies, and Hallmark starts playing their Christmas movies uh, in October. Uh, and so that I kind of consider, like, October the, like, very, 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 it's like Christmas preseason, right? Because Hallmark's starting to play some movies, you know, and you go to Walmart, and they kind of got their Christmas trees out in the very, very back. I love Christmas so much. I love, you know, Jesus, and I love family, and I love Santa Claus, and everything's just so great. I love Christmas. One thing, though, the one thing I cannot stand about Christmas, well, there's two things I can't stand about Christmas. Uh, the first thing is how people, like, watch these terrible Christmas movies. Not Hallmark movies. Hallmark movies are great. I can't stand how people act like Christmas movies that are actually not good are really good. Okay, I won't go into details because I don't want to, like, step on any toes here. That's the first thing. Christmas movies that people act like are good but aren't good. The second thing, though, and this is where I want to kind of focus, is this whole thing of Christmas cards, okay? Basically, what Christmas cards are, you buy 500 of them, and you send them to people that you don't care about, and then they send you one, and your friends. Does that make sense? So, for so, so, so many people, uh, like, if you were to ask them, how many friends do you have? Oh, I have 500 people on my Christmas card mailing list, you know, and I get 500 Christmas cards from all these people that I don't love and that I don't care about. Does that make sense? And so for a lot of people out there, there's a lot of people who every Christmas, they sort of like define their relationship with people they don't actually care about. So for a lot of people, their relationship with others is defined by like how many Christmas cards they send. Does that make sense? You kind of see what I'm saying? Basically, it's like for so many people, I'm sorry, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, so I'm sorry if I rant a little bit. Uh, for so many people, it's like, you know, they have a big list of people that they don't care about, but because they sent them a Christmas card, their friends. Does that make sense? Uh, and you know, I was kind of thinking about this, like in you know the context of like you know, or in light of like this passage, and I kind of realized that what the Israelites had done is they had sent God Christmas cards, all these goats that they had killed, all these you know animals that they had sacrificed, all this blood and the wine that they had poured on the altar. Like that was them sending a Christmas card to God. Does that make sense? So it's almost like they don't actually care about God. They don't actually love God. They love all these other gods, and they love, you know, oppressing the poor, and they love sinning, but they don't actually love God. But because they offer sacrifice to God, just like people will send a Christmas card to somebody else and be like, okay, yeah, we're so good. People offer a sacrifice to God, or the, the Israelites would offer sacrifices to God, and they'd be like, okay, yeah, thanks, God. We're, we're still good, right? We're still on good terms because I killed a goat the other day for you, right? My fear is that a lot of people today are like, okay, yeah, God, I went to church like two times last month, you know, so there we go. I even went to the Wednesday night Bible study, so there we go. Me and God are still on good terms. Or, or you know, okay, yeah, God, I put a nice big check in the offering plate, so there we go. There's your Christmas card. We're still friends. And it's like what Micah is saying in this passage is, no, 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 that's not how it works. It doesn't matter how many sacrifices you send or how many sacrifices you offer to God. It doesn't matter how many times you volunteer at BBS. It doesn't matter how many you know checks you put in the offering plate. Um, it doesn't matter how many Christmas cards you send to God. If your heart is far from God, God doesn't know you, and God doesn't care about your sacrifices, and God doesn't care about how many times you volunteer to PBS, and God doesn't care about your tithes. God just wants you, God wants your heart, and he wants your heart to be aligned with him, and he wants a right standing relationship with you. Let me move on. Um, oh yeah, so let me, let me add one more thing. Basically, how I want you guys to apply this, um, I just want you to realize the danger of what we might call works-based salvation. So it's so, so, so easy to fall into. I've fallen into it before. You know, if you were to ask me, like, okay, what makes you a Christian? I would say, well, I don't sin as much as other people. Or, okay, yeah, I, I go to church. I'm a good person. I'm usually really, really nice to most people that I meet. And so for a long time, that's what defined my relationship with God. So it's simple. Don't define your relationship with God based on how many good things you do. Does that make sense? All right, so let me move on. So now we've realized that compulsive sacrifices, whether it's killing a, doe, uh, a, 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 killing a goat in the Old Testament or volunteering a BBS in the New Testament or sending a Christmas card, like these compulsive sacrifices, they don't 
like God isn't saying like thank you, but like that doesn't actually matter. So that doesn't define your relationship with God. So let me ask you this: What does define your relationship with God? Well, uh, Micah answers this question in chapter six, verse eight. It says, "He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God." So Matthew twenty-two, Jesus is asked, "What is the greatest commandment?" He gives two commandments, or sort of like a twofold, like one twofold commandment, something like that. And he says, "Love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength." And then he says, "Love your neighbor as yourself." And he says that all that is written in the law and the prophets is summarized in this commandment. Okay, it's very interesting that in Matthew or in Micah chapter six, uh, God says, "What does the Lord require from you?" And he sort of outlines this twofold commandment. He says uh, he required to love justice, take love kindness. That's uh, to do justice and love kindness. That's you know love uh, your neighbors yourself, and to walk humbly with your God. So it's always like God's saying, okay, guys, thank you so much for these sacrifices, but that's not what the law is about. I gave you the law, and I gave you these sacrifices so that you could love justice and love mercy and love kindness, and that you would love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You know, the people, they totally miss the point of why God offered, or why God you know, gave them these sacrifices in the first place. These sacrifices were to remind them of their neediness of God, to remind them of just how offensive their sins are. And to remind them that their sin required blood has to be shed for the forgiveness of sins, for the sprinkling of sins. And so God gave them these sacrifices to remind them of that so they would anticipate an ultimate sacrifice that is to come that could actually truly take away sins. Um, but the people didn't realize that like the blood of a goat can't do anything. God doesn't actually like the blood of goats. You know, and that's what Micah's saying. He's like, in case you didn't know, God doesn't actually drink that blood. God doesn't actually drink that wine. That's not for God, that's for you, and you're totally missing the mark. Um, so, you know, again, just to illustrate this, I'd like to point you back to that story I told at the beginning when I saw uh, my very, very lovely girlfriend, Hannah. I bought her the flowers, and I put on a nice shirt, but I didn't think for a second that those flowers and that shirt is, is what was going to define my relationship with her. I did that because that's a nice thing to do, but I knew that she was going to be excited to see me because she loved me, and I love her, and because our hearts are so aligned with one another. And so my charge for you today, how I want you to apply this, is to realize that your heart is far from God, and no amount of good deeds can change that. Uh, and if I may give you a little bit of bad news, your heart is terrible, all right? You can't change your heart. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things, and that your righteousness is as filthy rags for God. So this whole thing of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, that sounds easy, but none of us can fulfill that. Because every single day we come up short. Every single day we become idolatrous. We refuse to love the Lord. We, we refuse to love our neighbors. Every single day we come up short. But thankfully, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life that fulfilled the requirements of the law, the requirements that no human being could ever fulfill. And so even though your heart is rotten and you are unable to turn your heart to God, Jesus, because he is perfect, because he is the perfect ultimate sacrifice, is able to take your your filthy, filthy heart and give you a new one. So if you will just turn to Jesus now, at, come humbly at his feet and say, you know, you're the Lord and I pray for your forgiveness, then Jesus will give you a new heart, one that is right with God, and he will give you a right standing relationship with God. Because no amount of killing goats and no amount of volunteering at BBS and no amount of sending Christmas cards can ever change your heart. Only Jesus can change your heart. So my challenge to you today is that if you're not a believer, I want you to look at your heart and say, you know what, my heart is really messed up, and I can't change anything about that. But I also want you to realize that there is one person who can, and Jesus Christ is his name. Uh, so I'm actually going to be standing down here. All right, if you're not a believer, what I want you to do is I want you to, or if you recognize that, that your heart is far from God, and if you want a new heart, then I want you to come and talk to me. Let us pray. Father, I come to you, Lord, and uh, I'm reminded as I read your word with just of your goodness and your faithfulness and your mercy. God, I pray that you convict uh, those in here of sin, any sin in their lives. I pray that we would realize that no amount of compulsive uh, uh, acts of what we might call goodness can make our hearts right with you. Um, so, God, I pray that you would give us new hearts, Lord, every single day. I pray that there's somebody here who doesn't know you, Father, their hearts would turn to you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you all.